everyone ignores the flight attendant when she tells you to read the card in the back of the seat pocket, and no one takes it seriously when your school does another earthquake drill. But after today's video, you'll never take these things for granted ever again. Be warned. The story behind the biggest overhaul to America's health and safety regulation will make you sad and angry. It's a heartbreaking tale of survival, and a gut-wrenching scandal of political corruption. In fact, it was New York's worst disaster until the September 11th attacks a century later. It's why the burning of the P.S. General Slocum has been referenced in plenty of American literature and movies. 1,000 people died that day in 1904. Most of them were women and children. They had taken the boat in the hopes of attending a picnic, but instead, the brutal demise paved the way for regulations that would, in turn, save countless more. Today, we honor the victims and shame the perpetrators. So it's time to learn how history works to find out the tragic story behind America's safety laws. Unlike the luxurious aura of the Titanic, the General Slocum did not ferry elites and dignitaries, but instead, humble folk. It was named after a general who helped lead the Union to victory in the American Civil War, but the allure to respect stood in dark contrast to the condition of the vessel. The single-cylinder wooden steamer was in a state of disrepair. Her reputation as a troubled boat would become an omen for things to come. A few months after launching, she ran aground off Rockaway. Tugboats were able to free her, but they would return soon enough when Slocum got grounded again, this time off Coney Island. Things only got worse. She struck a sandbar which severed the electrical generator. Another grounding forced the passengers to camp overnight in the cold. She crashed into a boat and later crashed into another which happened to be carrying 900 drunk anarchists from New Jersey. A riot broke out and the sodden would-be revolutionaries tried to seize control of the ship. She got a lot of bad press for a boat that had only been on the water for 10 years, yet the owners were able to find ways to keep her operational. That's because the P.S. Locum still had appeal as a modest pleasure cruiser. Her wooden hull was painted in a brilliant white, and her towering funnels were visually striking. The massive paddle wheels were impressive in looks and speed, and the open windows along the salon decks funneled fresh air and gave stunning views. However, these features would contribute to her downfall. Having the once splendid ship relegated to nothing more than a water taxi for the working class meant that the owners, the Knickerbocker Steamship Company, did not consider maintenance a high priority. On the 15th of June, 1904, a church-going German immigrant community was preparing for their annual picnic. The sun was shining, the skies were clear, a band was playing on deck, it was a picturesque day for happy memories. Most of the fathers and husbands were out working, so the women and young babies boarded the ship that fateful day alone. A deckhand reported to the captain that 1,000 tickets had been collected, but this number did not include the 300 or so children under 10 who traveled for free, nor the crew and catering staff. As everyone packed onto the boat, they had no idea that only 300 or so of them would be alive in just a few minutes. How could anyone have known that there were problems below deck? A fire inspector even had deemed the equipment to be in fine working order. This all changed when the ship passed through a portion of the river that is known as Hellgate. No one knows exactly how the fire started, though it was said that a 12-year-old boy was the first to report sights of flames to the captain. The child was dismissed, but in 10 minutes' time, the lower deck crew had corroborated the young kid's testimony. Puffs of smoke were rising through the wooden floorboards and the velvet upholstered wicker chairs. The cabins and storerooms underneath were filled with machinery and oil barrels. It is theorized that the frequent reshuffling of crew quarters helped to create an atmosphere of complacency. The most likely catalyst for this disaster was a discarded match or thrown out cigarette butt. Flammable liquid, oil rags, and straw had been spilled over the floor of the lamp room, a place you wouldn't expect the crew to go for their smoking break. Then again, the crew of the PS Locum hadn't attended a fire drill in over a year though some sources say the crew had never had any fire training whatsoever. However, instinct did kick in when the alarm was raised. The below-deck crew sprang into action. They grabbed fire hoses and buckets, but quickly retreated claiming it was like trying to put out hell itself. Perhaps they would have had better luck if the fire hoses had been replaced, instead of left to rot and crack. By 10 a.m., a fire notice had gone out. Several witnesses reported that the flames appeared at different locations, which suggests the fire spread quickly due to combustible fuel. Pastor George Haas was enjoying the music with his wife and daughter at the time. He remarked that after everyone heard the shouts of fire, the three upper decks were completely engulfed in no more than three minutes. The fire grew so quickly that even onlookers from Manhattan saw flames and smoke rising into the sky. Captain William Van Schaik had to do something drastic. There was a nearby dock, however, he refused to approach. Why? Well, an evacuation could have been jeopardized if the dock had been set ablaze. 
There was also a concern that the giant paddles might break if pushed too fast and steered too sharply, leaving them stranded. Instead, he had no other choice but to go full steam ahead and run it aground in the shallow waters of a small island. But the blowing air through the open salon docks fanned the flames and turned the slocum into a fireball. By now, pandemonium was spreading as viciously as the fire. The upper decks collapsed and sent passengers tumbling into the flames below. Children were trampled under the feet of panicked crowds. One man was covered in flames, but when he threw himself overboard, the mighty paddle swallowed him up whole. A young boy shimmied up the flagstaff, believing he could escape the terror. But he succumbed to the terrible heat and plummeted into the core of the blaze. Passengers hurled themselves into the water, but even those who knew how to swim had immense difficulty due to the heavy wool clothing at the time. Those in the waters also had to contend with overcrowding and terrified passengers clamoring for anything to stay afloat. And of course, you had to withstand the soaring temperatures and suffocating smoke. The lifeboats were inoperable too, either because they were stuck to the sides of the boat from dry paint or because the way they were tied made them impossible to free. But worse were the life jackets. They were rotten and fell apart upon touch. Some life jackets seemed intact, but the cork inside had turned to dust, which meant the material absorbed water like a sponge. Parents only realized this when they tossed their children to safety. John Kircher's harrowing survival story recounts the moment his wife put one of these defective life preservers on their young daughter. They believed their child would float, but the child never appeared. She had sunk as though its stone were tied to her. It took two long minutes for the Slocum to finally beach at North Brother Island. Until it did, all the fire engines could do was watch as bobbing corpses filled the waters around the burning wreckage. When it reached the shore, rescue was ready. Workers at the Riverside Hospital had prepared their pumps and hoses, and the island's fire whistle had notified dozens of neighboring boats to aid the rescue. Yet, the plan did not go smoothly. Hospital staff and rescuers threw rafts into the water or swam to save people, but the heat was too much. They couldn't get close. One rescuer was teenager Mary McCann. She was a recent immigrant from Ireland, recuperating from an illness at the hospital. But she swam out time and time again to pull as many children she could to safety. Soon though, it would become clear that the people brought to shore were almost always dead. Within an hour, 150 or so bodies were laid out on the sand. Mostly women, some still clutching the lifeless bodies of their infants. But there were survivors. 12-year-old Louise Galing saved the toddler she was babysitting by treading water until rescue came. 13-year-old John Tishner kept his friend awake by kicking her shins and then dragging her by the hair so she stayed above the water's surface. There was a 10-month-old baby boy who floated to shore unharmed. However, they would now join the other orphans who were milling on shore in a daze. Just 20 minutes before, their families had been alive, listening to music, and eagerly awaiting a picnic. Now, they had no family. The last person off the ship was Captain Van Shake. He swam to shore but was blinded and crippled by the blaze. But there are conflicting reports. Some say that he was first to get off, having deserted his post the moment the boat banked. 90 minutes after the Slocum hit the shore of the island, the burning ship drifted out and collapsed into shallow waters, extinguishing the fire once and for all. But this wasn't the end of the disaster. Husbands searched morgue upon morgue to locate their missing wives and children. Soon, they would be searching for answers. Sorrow turned to anger as New Yorkers demanded to know what happened and who was to blame. Was it the captain's fault for not docking immediately? Or was the company to blame for not maintaining the boat? What about the fire inspector who had given the okay? The ensuing trial saw scores of witnesses taking the stand. Many were in bandages or bearing life-altering scars and afflictions. They testified about the condition of the life jackets, the uselessness of the lifeboats, and the trauma of watching their loved ones die before their very eyes. In total, eight people were indicted by a federal grand jury. The captain, two inspectors, the president of the boat company, plus its secretary, treasurer, and commodore. The jury reached their verdict on January 27, 1906. 70-year-old Captain Van Schaik was found guilty of criminal negligence and misconduct. He was sentenced to 10 years of hard labor in Sing Sing Prison. But only he was found guilty. All other parties got off, including the fire inspectors who were rumored to have been paid by the boat owners. Despite mountains of evidence that the boat was unsafe, including proof of falsified inspection reports, the company only received a small fine and was virtually acquitted of any wrongdoings. 1,000 people's lives got the Knickerbocker Steamship Company no more than a slap on the wrist. Just days after the initial disaster aboard the Slocum, her sister ship restarted its ferry services. That summer, it was discovered she too had rotten life jackets on board. The company even salvaged the Slocum's remains into another barge to save cash. The disaster was seen as a crossroads between greed and classism, where the lives of poor women and children were worth less than the profits of a corrupt company. I thought that my uh, mother and father had saved me. 
but they had se they were separated, uh, and so apparently whatever happened. Um, that I, my mother must have let go of me. Another insult is how the captain was pardoned by President Taft in December of 1911. But some say he got justice because he was made the fall guy for a disaster he wasn't responsible for. The neighborhood of Little Germany did not last after that. Members had already been moving out of the area, so the significant loss to its population meant the community eventually dissolved. However, something did come out of it to help unify people. Federal and state regulators were motivated to improve emergency equipment on passenger ships. This included life jackets for everyone on board, throwable flotation devices, visual distress signals, and fire extinguishers. Over time, this legislation has adapted with the development of new technology such as long-range radios and ventilation systems. These things might be commonplace now, and sometimes private companies duck them, but it came at a terrible cost, just not to the company responsible. So who is really to blame for the disaster of the PS General Slocum? Let us know your verdict in the comments. If you'd like to learn more about how old companies changed the modern world, check out our video on Tesla and Edison. And be sure to subscribe to keep on learning how history works.